Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okie dokie. And if you have any questions, post them in the chat. Um, everybody should be able to see my screen at this point. And we will just get started with Module 3. Um, decision and branching. This module is where we really start to tell Python what it is we want it to do. Um, up until now, we've done some input and some output and some string manipulation, and that's been great. But what we need to do now is we need to teach Python how to make the decisions that we want it to make. All programs make decisions. You know, if you know, if you have put in, you know, the wrong date for your credit card, it's going to come back and say that's the wrong date. Well, how does it do that? It does that because it asks a series of questions that the programming language can understand. It says, okay, go out to the credit card company with this number and tell me whether or not that date is correct. And if the date isn't correct, then it comes back and says you got a problem. But the issue is that computer programs don't have the ability to make decisions like we would. You know, we could say, is the sky blue? And answer yes or no. We could say that, we could say, you know, um, sorry, drawing a blank. We could say, I want a 52 inch TV or would a 52-inch TV or a 67-inch TV be better? A computer can't know that. It doesn't know what better is. So we have to change how we ask questions so that the programming language can understand what we're doing. And that is what Zybooks Module 3 and what you're going to be doing this week is all about. Uh, so the concept comes in of something called branching. And branching is basically, what do you do when you ask a computer the question? Um, because maybe there can be multiple things that you want it to do, not just one. So that's what a branch is. And we're going to go and we're going to actually look at some code and talk about what branching is. Um, how do we branch? There is one keyword that I use more than anything when I'm when I'm writing in Python or Java for that matter. It's the word if. If is how you begin a sentence, or sorry, a question in Python. So if you're about to ask Python a question, you start it with the word if. That indicates to Python that you're going to be asking a question and Python's going to have to give you an answer. And based on the answer that it gives you, it's going to do something. Because it's not good enough just to get the answer. You need to tell Python that it's got to do something once it gives you the answer. So that is what branching is and that's what the if statement does. You cannot ask a question to Python if you don't start it with an if. If is a keyword and you can't use it for anything else. Um, so they're just doing a branch example. So I'm going to bring up some code and I'm going to say simple if. Now a few things we don't know here yet. We don't know about Boolean expressions with greater than or less than. But this is the basic format. So I've got some value here. I've just called it hotel rate. I've got some age here, so you know we're going to enter an age. And then I'm going to calculate the hotel rate based on the user's age because if they're a senior citizen, they're going to get a discount. That's what this program does. So let's just walk through it really quick. In fact, we're going to walk through it in the debugger because we know I like debuggers. So this is going to be simple. If Okay, so I'm going to start in the debugger. Now we already know what lines one and three do. We've been with lines one and three for the last two weeks. I know that hourly rate is a variable. 
It's, I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, and the value is 155. User age is a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. I am inputting the person's age, and I'm going to convert it to an int. We know this. We've done it for two weeks. So now what am I adding? I'm adding this whole if-else thing here. Okay, so what I'm saying is I'm asking a question to the computer, to, to Python, actually. I'm asking a question to Python, and Python is making it, it, it's using the computer to answer the question. So I'm saying if, because I'm about to answer, ask a question to Python. I'm going to use a variable. The net. Everything you do after the if is about variables, values, and expressions, okay? Now, this is important. You're going to have a variable. You're going to have some form of an operator, and you're going to have some form of a value. That is the basic construct of the if statement. So what you're doing is you're comparing what is on the left-hand side of the Boolean operator and what's on the right-hand side of the Boolean operator. User age is on the left-hand side. In this case, 65 is on the right-hand side. And the Boolean operator is a greater than sign. And we're going to go through all the Boolean operators in a little bit. But this is just to get us introduced to the, the construct that we're using. So. What I am telling Python to do is I'm telling Python to compare user age to the number 65. And if user age is greater than the number of 65, I want it to do what's on line 6 and 7. If it is not, which is what that else statement says, then I want it to do what's on line 9. And then the program is always going to do what's on line 11. So this is just to get us used to the construct. So I have an if, which asks a question. I have an else, which says, you know, if this isn't true, then do what's down here. And then I have the concept of inside the block and outside the block. And we'll go through that a little bit more later. Those are the lines 6 and 7 are inside the if block. Line 9 is if inside the else block, so they're different. So let's just walk through this in the debugger real quick. And I want to show you a couple of things here in the debugger that will make your life easier, especially when we start getting into some of the harder assignments and the project. So right now, I'm sitting on line 3. I'm about to put in a user age, so let me do that. Let me go to the console, and I'll put in 42. And now I should have put in 65, sorry. So well, I'll do that in a second. So I'm going to go back to the debugger, and I am on line 5, and I have a hotel rate of 155, user age of 42. So now I am going to step over this line. And what Python is going to do is it's going to say is 42, and I can put my mouse over that and Python PyCharm will tell me what the value is. Is 42 greater than 65? Well, we will say no, that's not true. So Python is not going to exit line six execute line six or seven. It's going to drop all the way down to line nine. Well what just happened? What just happened is this evaluated to false so it won't touch what's going on in 6 or 7. And we told it, if it doesn't evaluate to true, then do what's on line 9. And then it's always going to do what's on 11. So if I run this one more time, and I put in my age of 67, I'm going to get your old so you get a discount. And so it gives me a $20 discount. So that's the basic construct. So that's something to keep in your mind while we're going through some of the, um, well, through the rest of Zybooks and also while we're going through the pseudocode for the labs. 
Um, and by the way, all of this will be up with links um, probably tomorrow. So, Booleans, or if statements can only evaluate to one of two values, let me see. I just did if else. Okay. A, a, an if statement can evaluate to true or it can evaluate to false. And by the way, this is what we just did um, in the pie charm. So we have to learn how to ask a question so that the the answer will be true or false. So for this particular issue, what we're doing is saying or making a statement. We're saying Python, is it true that user age is greater than 65? That's what we're really saying to Python. And Python will come back and it will say, well, user age is 42. And 42 is not greater than 65, so I'm going to tell you the word false. And if I had put in 67, Python would have said, well, user age is 67, and 67 is greater than 65, so I'm going to tell you it's true. But those are the only two values that Python can give you it, from, an, from an evaluation of an if statement. It can either be true or false. This is one of the biggest stumbling blocks new programmers have to Python, to any programming language, is figuring out how to word what they want to happen. Because you know what you want to happen. You know that when you hit, you know, the dungeon room in your game and the user says, go north, you know what you want to happen. But... We, that we have to learn how to translate that when I say I'm in the dungeon and I go north and I'm going to end up in the parlor, I have to be able to translate that into a series of small steps for Python. And that's what we're learning to do. And it can be frustrating and it can be a little bit odd to learn to talk to the computer like that. Um, so let's... Um, you can have more than an if and an else statement. You can have multiple branches. So each of these is a branch. Let's go back to PyCharm. Each of the, this is a branch right here. Those, these three lines, five, six, and seven are a branch. Eight and nine are another branch. And we can create as many branches as we want. And this is why it's called branching. Because if you envision this in a graph, what you're going, the graph would basically have a line coming out for the if and another line coming out of the root for the else and then kind of going back together, um, which is what a flow chart would do. And you're going to talk about, you're going to learn about flow charts in um, this module as well or in the Brightspace module. Um, so if I look at many branches. Now I've expanded. Okay, so I had a simple if, and now I've got this many branches. So all of a sudden I've gone from making two decisions to making one, two, three, four, six decisions. So how did I do that? Well, there's another keyword, LF. So we have the keyword if, which asks the initial question. We have the keyword else, which basically says, in lieu of anything else being true, or if, if everything else evaluates to false, then do what's in my, my branch, my block. And now we have these new elif, okay? Elif, E-L-I-F, is a way of saying, oops, Yep. Oh, yes, I can zoom in a little. There. How's that? Is that better? Make my screen a little bigger here, too. Okay, cool. So what I have here is 
I have the initial question. You always have to start it with an if. You cannot have an elif or an else without first having an if. Elif, so if says, if value less than zero is true, then go to line, do what's on line five. Elif says, well, if the if statement didn't evaluate to true, try this statement. So try value one greater than or equal to one and value one less than or equal to five. And we will get to the Boolean operators in just a bit. Um, and so here we have another, okay, these other two didn't evaluate to true. So let's try the next line. And then it's, again, you can have as many LF statements as you want. I think I... I was writing a pr programming language once many years ago. It was in C and C++. So I wrote another programming language in the C and C++ language. And I had a, a, a dictionary and a lexicon. And I think my LF statement was like 50 because of all the different things the language could do. So these can be really big. Um, you have to understand that they're mutually exclusive. If line five happens, no other line after that will happen. If line seven happens, no other line after that will happen. And I can guarantee you that line five didn't happen either. So this is multi-branch. And this is where you can get really complex. But this is the kind of thing you'll need to understand to do your game. One of the things. So I'm just going to run through this real quick. I'm just going to go to multi-branch. Oh, many branches. There we are. And I'm going to debug it because I wanted to show you the concept of mutual exclusivity. So I'm going to start with uh, my age is going to be minus 1, which is a ridiculous age, but I'm putting it in there for a point. So I have val is minus 1, which is fine. And I'm saying if val is less than 0. Well, I can say, well, val is minus 1, so minus 1 is less than 0. So I am going to execute line 5, which is going to print this out to the console. And then nothing else happens. I'm done. And that's because I executed line 5. And because I have if, elif, elif, else, all of these other things won't happen. They can't happen because these are mutually exclusive. This will never be true if this was already true. Oops. Are you able to use an if or else statement on non-integers meeting a set? Sets are less, oh yeah. If the words are typed, say this instead, I can seem to make that work. Okay. Part of what may be the issue is that um, the, the Boolean operators are a little different. Um, and we can go over some of that. So what you really are dealing with when you're dealing with strings and or lists because you can't really do it with a dictionary, is you're dealing with equality. So you're trying to figure out if something is equal to another. And that's, that's what you would have to do. We can go over that a little bit later. Um, because you're going to have to understand specifically how to do that with a string. So... That's what mutual exclusivity is, and I'll run this one more time with the debugger, and I'll make the age, let's do something in the middle. We'll make it 8. Okay? So 8 is not less than 0, so what's going to happen? Well, it's not going to do line 5 because 8 is greater than zero, not less than zero. So val is eight. So the question is, is eight greater than or equal to one? Yes, it is. 
and is 8 less than or equal to 5? No, it isn't. So we're going to evaluate to false. And I'm going to go, I've got a whole thing on just the Boolean operators. So don't worry about that. And here we get is 8 greater than or equal to 6? Yep. And is 8 less than or equal to 9? Yep. So what's going to happen is I'm going to execute line 9 because it's in the block. And then I'm done because everything else is mutually exclusive. So that's the multi-if-else, and then they give you a lot more if-else. You can nest if-else statements. You can nest them as deep as you want to go. And this is also become, going to become important because you're going to have to use that in your game. But this is just to let you know that the same rules apply. So if in this example I execute, you know, User choice is, in fact, 1. I will execute line 5, and none of the rest of this stuff is going to happen. If my user choice is 2, then I'm in this code block. Something will happen on 7, 8, 9, and 10. Well, 7 is an if statement, so it's just going to evaluate that if statement. And that if statement is num items. So we know what num items is 5. We would say OK. Well, 5 is not less than 0. So I'm going to go down to 10 because we know that if this evaluates the false, we will tell Python, well, you know, if the previous statement evaluated to false, then, you know, do this. So we will, we will, execute line 10, and then we're done because this is mutually, mutually exclusive. If they're in the same grouping, so if you have if, elif, and else, then it can only either do line 5, come in here and figure out which one of these to do, or line 12. Um, oh, and what I didn't do, and I apologize, I should have done this first syntax. If always starts a question, then you have one or some number of expressions, and then you've got our little friend here, the colon. I find more people getting frustrated because they have forgotten this colon than um, you can imagine. It is one of those syntactical things that can drive people crazy. Just like when we write an English question and we put the question mark afterwards, you have to put the colon. Without the colon, nothing works. So right now, everything's fine, it's happy, everything just ran. If I simply delete this one colon right here, and I run this again, I get syntax error invalid syntax. Of course, it doesn't say, hey, you need a colon. It just tells you that it's invalid syntax. So without that one colon, my entire program doesn't run. So we have to remember our colons. We also have to remember our indents. Indenting becomes exceptionally important starting now. Python is a space delimited language. I say spaces and cases. It's space delimited and it's case sensitive. So you'll notice that in my if else statements, if is the if word is left justified, but the print word isn't. And the print word isn't left justified because the only way Python knows that it has what it has to do after it evaluates to true from an if, an elif, or an else statement is because the next line is indented. So if I remove this indentation and attempt to run it, first of all, PyCharm will show you all of the lovely red. It's going to say indentation error expected an indented block. All I did was remove a tab. And that's because Python relies on this tab to know what to do. If that 
if your indentation is wrong, if your indentation is off, Python is going to give you a message, and sometimes it's not going to be a nice message. It's just going to be a message that that will be hard to understand. So cases and spaces matter. Indentation is massively important. And that goes for an elif, just the same. It's going to give me an indentation error. All of it is the same. And that's because it has to know what to do once a statement has evaluated to true. Um, so this is another important concept, multiple distinct if statements. So we have this relationship between if, elif, and else. If, you, if the if evaluates to true, it's going to do what's in the if block and nothing else. If elif evaluates to true, it's going to do what's in its block and nothing else. So, and that's called mutual exclusivity. You can also have multiple independent if statements. So if I had multiple independent if statements, let me just do this, and I'll run it for you. And you'll see that there's a difference. Okay, and I'll get rid of this stuff. Oops. Whoops. Sorry about this. I didn't think about this example. Okay, so this is multiple independent ifs. So if you look at this and you contrast with many branches here, let me make it bigger. Um, okay, that should be better. If you contrast this with many branches, you'll see these are just independent if statements, and you'll see this is an if, elif, 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 elf. So the difference is these aren't mutually exclusive. So you can have user ages less than 16, and it'll print here, or user age is greater than 15, and it'll print here, or greater than 17, greater than 24. So I have 20, and I'm going to get several different print statements. So let's run through this really quick. And I'll show you what I mean. Because before, we only ever hit one of the statements. Now we're going to hit multiple ones. So if I debug this, we see down here in the debugger that age is 20. So I'm going to step over. 20 is less, is not less than 16. So I'm not going to do that. But 20 is greater than 15. So I am going to end up processing line 8. 20 is greater than 17. So I'm going to print. Um, and execute line 11. 20 is not greater than 24. So I'm not going to print, a, I'm not going to end up on line 14. And 20 is not greater than 34. But I got that I'm old enough to drive and I'm old enough to vote. So these are not mutually exclusive. Because they're just a series of if statements, there's no mutual exclusivity. Uh, if, if I wrote my program, in such a way, I could potentially hit lots of them. So that's the difference between independent if statements and a, um, a series of if, elif, and else statements that are mutually exclusive. These statements, independent if statements, are not mutually exclusive. Um, relational operators. 
relational operators are how we do if statements. They're how we do branching. And you'll have heard me say a lot, you know, a variable is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And I say single equal sign because double equal sign is about what we're going to start using. Double equal sign is about equality. Is the thing on the left-hand side the same as the thing on the right-hand side? If that evaluates to true, then we have equality. If it does not evaluate to true, then we have inequality. So the double equal sign means A is the same as B. Now, here's another, here's a different one, and it is the exclamation point equal. That means that what's on the left-hand side of my expression is not the same as what's on the right-hand side of my expression. So they will evaluate differently, and you can check for equality or inequality, depending on the type of thing that you need Python to do. These are important. Oftentimes what I see people doing, because Python won't correct you, is, uh, let, me, let me just put this down here, or up here. Python won't correct me if I do this. Oh, PyCharm will. Okay, so if I run this, oh, sorry, invalid syntax, but it doesn't tell you that you need a double equal sign here because this is, this is not valid. What we think of as an equal sign is assignment. What Python needs in an if statement is equality. Oops. Okay, is the ability to evaluate. So a Boolean expression is different from an assignment. So people get, mi get mixed up at this point. Um, here are the rest of our relational operators. Our relational operators basically say, how does the left-hand side relate to the right-hand side? Well, we less than, a, you know, left-hand side is less than the right-hand side. Greater than, you know, right-hand side is greater than the left, sorry, left-hand is greater than the right-hand. Less than or equal and greater than or equal. They all pretty much mean what we think they mean. I'm uh, comparing character strings and floating point types. Oh, let's see. Do I have some of these? Yeah. Three... Well, um, as part of what I will put up, even though we probably don't have time to go over them, here are a couple of different challenges that you can use and evaluate. Um, and we can go back and look at these if we need to, but um, I usually go over these. But I want to go over the pseudocode for the labs, so I'm probably not going to go over those unless you guys want me to go back after doing the pseudocode for the lab. So how do we can compare strings to strings, floating points to floating points, and characters to characters? Well, we do it very similarly. We just have to make sure that our left-hand side is the same type as the right-hand side. So in this case, we have my stir is equivalent to Tuesday. Now, you'll notice that Tuesday is in quotes. And I've used the double, or Zybooks has used the double equal sign. So that's pretty much how you evaluate it. Now, it's interesting what they bring up here. And what they're talking about is they're talking about the case sensitivity for Python. Like I said, spaces and cases. Capital T Tuesday is not the same as lower T Tuesday. They are different words to Python. If you are sure that 
you put in a capital T Tuesday and that that capital T Tuesday should have worked, then you need to check your expression because maybe, and I've seen this a lot, um, you will have put in Tuesday with a lowercase t or something similar. Um, and it's one of those small things, especially when people come from a, a Windows world where case doesn't matter, that can escape students. It's one of those minute things. I work in a Linux world, so everything under the sun is case sensitive. So I've had case sensitivity drilled into my brain for a long time. But coming from a Windows world, it's strange, and it's new, and it's different, and it's, it's something that you will have to consciously think about. So that's what I mean by spaces and cases. Boolean operators and expressions. So here's where we actually can get really complex, and this is something that you're going to need to do. So I have my Boolean operators equality, inequality, greater than, less than, greater than or equal, less than or equal. Not too hard. But now we are going to have an expression. And an expression happens when you start combining um, your left, you, you start combining, well, sorry, a Boolean expression is when you have a left-hand side, a Boolean operator, and a right-hand side. You can then combine those using and, or, and not to make more complex decisions. That's really what we're doing. We're making more complex decisions. Um, and so we come to this Boolean operators table. And this can be a little bit confusing to some students. So I do have an example. But basically, remember, an if, elif, or else state. Well, if or, if or elif statements can only evaluate to true or false. So then what happens if you are adding up a lot of these expressions to try and decide something? Well, you have to understand that the um, operator and, or, and not can change the outcome. And how do we understand that? We understand that by basically saying, uh, looking at this table. Um, and this is something that, again, as you program more, you're just going to, it's just going to happen. But basically false and false is always false. False and true is always false. True and false is always false. The only time with an and statement that you will get a true is when they're both true. The, it's different, the opposite in fact, with, not quite opposite, but it's different with or. If you're using or, only one part of the expression has to be true and the whole thing is true. And then if you have not, say not A or not B, it is the opposite. So if A was true, not A is false. And I've got a little example of that. Uh, where is it? Um, oh, what did I do with it? Simple Boolean, simple branch. Sorry. Simple Boolean. There we go. Okay, so this is just some code to help you along with that table. And there's anding and oring, and that's what it is. If you're adding an and, you're anding. If you're adding an or, you're oring. If, um, so here, let's just look at the very first statement. Let me make this bigger. Okay, so I just have A and B, 10 and 1. And I have if A is greater than B and B is great, sorry, if A is greater than zero and B is greater than zero, then I'm going to do this. If not, I'm not going to do that. If A is less than 10, 
and B is greater than zero, then I'm not going to really print anything, or I'm going to print this. So let's just run through this really quick. Simple Boolean. Simple Boolean. Okay, we're just going to run through this in the debugger. And I have an A of 1, and a, an A of 10, and a B of 1. So when I step over, if I look at this expression, now this is the nice thing about PyCharm, um, it'll say that A is 10 and B is 1. Well, 10 is greater than 0 and 1 is greater than 0. Remember, we're at that table and we're talking about AND. So I'm going to print A is greater than 0 evaluates to true. And again, see what PyCharm just did for me. I moved it from A, which is 10, to the end of the expression, and it says bool true. And that means that A is greater than 10 evaluated to true. And then if I go over here and do the same thing for B is greater than 0, it's going to evaluate to true. So it's important to true, true here, because that's how the whole thing comes to true, and that's how I got to line 8. Now, if I'm looking at A less than 10 and B greater than 0, what do we think is going to happen? Well, let's look at each part of the expression. Is A less than 10? Well, since A is 10, that is a no, which means it's a false. Now, what Python's going to do is it's not going to even look at the rest of the statement. It does not care. The first time, if there's an and, and it hits one false, the whole thing is false. So what's going to happen? Well, sorry about that. I'm going to go to line 13, and I'm going to say false, true, which is what it was, and that's what I'm going to print. So now, A is equivalent to 10 and B is less than zero. So let's see. Well, the first part is true. A is in fact 10, so they are equal. But B is not less than zero, and I still have an and here. So this is going to evaluate to false, because even though A is the same as 10, B is greater than zero, so it is not less than zero. So it's going to be false, which means I'm going to go down to line 18. So that's all and. So now I come here and I'm going to change some things up. I'm using or. So A is greater than zero or B is greater than zero. Well, that evaluates the same as it did with an and. Everything is true. If it's true, it's true. So now I am down here and I've got A is less than 10 or B is greater than 0. Well, A, we already know A is not less than 10 because A is 10. So if this had been an AND, the whole thing would have evaluated to false. But because this is an OR, it evaluates to true, which means I'm actually going to execute line 25. And that's because it's an OR. Oh, I didn't do that right. Sorry. Or, or, and or. Okay. So the only way you're going to get a false false is if both sides are false. And so I'm going to come down here. And I, I'll, um, again, this will be uploaded. So that's what Boolean expressions are about. And you can have as many of ands and ors that you need in your uh, code. Um, let me see. Membership and identity operators. So this is important. It's in and not in. And this is the where we are talking about uh, lists and sets. In will let us know if there is a value that is contained in a list, and they're called membership operators, in and not in. Um, 
And so that's what we want. We want to know if something is in a list or not, or if two lists are equal. Now, I had a question this week from a student because there's, um, let me see, there is a, I think it's a challenge. Uh, no, there's a question about comparing lists. So let me do that real fast. We're going to go over a little tonight because I still do want to go over the, um, sorry, I still do want to go over the pseudocode. I apologize if I seem a little out of it. I've been working 12-hour days for the last several weeks because we have a deadline, and that's the world of software. Um, so this is compare list. So I have a list, and I'm going to say L1 is 1, 2, and 5, and L2 is 0, 2, and 5. Now, if L1 is greater than L2, I won't do that, I'll say. So the way Zybooks describes this is uh, that the way, the, the way Zybooks describes how Python is going to do this is it's going to say, is 1 greater than 0? Well, that's true. And then Zybook says that the way it's going to be is that it's going to say is 2 greater than 2, and that's false. So you would think that this would come out as false. If one list 1 is greater than list 2, that it would come out as false. That's not how Python works. 1 is, in fact, greater than 0. However, Python is going to ignore, in this comparison, Python is going to ignore equivalent values. So it's, it's not even going to check whether 2 is greater than 2. It's going to say 2 is 2, so I'm skipping. And 5 is 5, so I'm skipping. So if I run this, so is this the question you had about comparing lists? Michael, is this the question you had? If not, let me know, and we can go over that, too. So let me do this. Well, you guys can run this. So that is what a list comparison will do. So the outcome of this would be um, 1 is greater than 0, true, 2, two so ignore. 5 is the same as 5, so ignore. That's how it's evaluated. So, okay, order of evaluation. This is exactly the same as numerical order of evaluation. If you understand order of evaluation with arithmetic, you will understand order of evaluation, and then you just add on the logical operators. You add on not, and, and, or, and these are just how they, you know, it's their order. Not will always be evaluated before an and or an or. And will always be evaluated before an or. And or will always be evaluated last. So if you're combining ands and ors, or nots, ands, and ors, or any combination of those, you just have to understand that new order. All the rest of the stuff is the same thing we learned in algebra. Code blocks and indentation. I already talked about indentation. Indentation will be the bane of your existence for about a week, maybe two, because we are going to do loops next week, and loops are all about indentation too. 
if you're having weird errors, start looking back through your code and seeing where things might not be lined up. That's what I would suggest. Indentation is important and you have to understand where you are. Um, conditional expressions. I don't usually use these. Um, you know, expression when true, if condition, else expression when false. So we've already kind of talked about the concept. This is a shorthand. The concepts remain the same. You can use this as a shorthand. I don't tend to do it as a shorthand because I don't think it's as readable, but it's completely valid syntax. If you guys want to do that, that's your prerogative. Um, I personally, and I don't think any other teacher should take off anything if you use those expressions. So this is just additional practice. And then we have the labs. So this week we're going to go do something different with the labs. And these guys will be up when uh, I'll put the images for this up on the YouTube page. So we're going to talk about pseudocode. This week you're learning about pseudocode. And I've already discussed this with the school, and they're completely happy. So I can share the pseudocode with you for the labs. So what do we have here? Well, we have the actual pseudocode for the lab logic. And I've also added some uh, little blowouts. Excuse me, I'm just... <coughs> Excuse me, please. Sorry about that. We have some additional blowouts that tell you where things are. So... For instance, we lab three in the pseudocode, you're going to have three numbers. You're going to have a first number, a second number, and a third number. And then you're going to have to compare those numbers somehow. So um, you're going to input, that's what you're going to do. You're going to input those three numbers, and well, where is input? Even though we've done it, I did say, you know, if you're having trouble with input, go to section 1.3. And then we're going to ask our questions. We're going to say, if my first number is less than or equal to. So is less than or equal to is, an, is a relational operator, and you're going to want to look at Zybook section 3.4. And here we're going to have our additional relational operators, or our expression operators. And you're going to put an and, and you can get to that at 3.5. And then we've got this whole multi-branch at section 3.2. So if you need to go and review the syntax, the concepts, you can go review it there. So for lab 3.1, let's just go back and read. Sorry. So write a program whose inputs are three integers and whose output is the smallest of the three integers. So how do we do that? Well, we do that by, first of all, we accept the input. We know how to accept input. You're going to have to make sure you convert it to integers because remember, everything in Python that comes from the outside is a string. So you need that in function. So now, how do I decide what's the, what's the smallest number? Well, I have to compare the numbers to each other. And the most efficient way to do it is to use the, the more compound expressions. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the first number to the second number, and I'm going to say is it less than or equal. And then if the first number is less than or equal to the third number, I know for a fact that the first number is got to be the smallest. And you'll notice I said and here. That and is very important. So if first is less than or equal to the second and first is less than or equal to the third, then the first by default has to be the smallest. So I'm now going to do the exact same thing but with the second value. So is the second value less than or equal to the first? That's, if it is, then I'm going to say, oh, is the second less than or equal to the third as well? And if that is, evaluates to true, then by default, the second has to be the smallest. And if not, then there's nothing else to do, so you're going to output the third number. 
So that is the pseudocode and the logic for Lab 311. Um, and by the way, go ahead and ask any questions about the pseudocode that you need to. So 3.12 is you're going to write a program that takes date as the input and outs the date, output the date season. So the input is going to be, you're going to have an input that represents a month, and you're going to have an input that represents the day. So the month is going to be a string, and the day is going to be an integer. Now this one is a little bit more complex. So we have our two basic inputs. We're going to input a string that's the month. We're going to input a day that is an integer. So I have to do two things, okay? I have to figure out what the month is. And then when I have figured out what the month, I have to figure out what the day is and then output the season. And the uh, program tells us the details of that. So if month is January and the grade, day is greater than equal, uh, equal to zero and the day is less than or equal to 31, then I know it has to be winter. Okay? Again, there is an and here and an and here. So here I am comparing the month and then I am comparing the day twice. I am comparing the day to whether it's greater than or equal to zero. So it's got to be at least one. And if it's less than or equal to 31. Well, why am I doing that? Well, because January has, you start off at the 1st and you end, off, end at the 31st. So it has to be between those numbers. So if I put in the month January and I put in the number 42, it's certainly not going to evaluate to that. And it's going to skip over that. And it's eventually going to end up here at output invalid. And by the way, this is flows down and then up and in over. It's just two columns. So then I'm going to evaluate the month again. If, if, I, if, I did, if I did not put in January, the first thing that Python's going to do is say, okay, well, you didn't put in January. It's going to fall to this else if statement. I'm going to say, is the month February? And if the month is February, then it's going to go look at the rest of this. And if it's not, then it's going to fall to the next LS statement. And then if it's March, well, I've got a lot more stuff going on here in March. Now, one of the things that I want you to look at here is this indentation. This indentation is important, and the indentation is correct. So you have to pretty much mimic this indentation. So I have a left justified if and then I indent one for the output. Left justified elif, I indent one for the output. I have a left justified elif, I'm starting to sound like a broken record. Then I indent one for a number of lines. And that's because I have to determine if it is going to be winter or spring based on the day. So you'll notice on this LIF, I'm not comparing days like I am up here for February and I am up there for January. And that is because I have more things that I have to determine. I, I'm not just checking whether the dates are good. I'm checking to see where that cutoff is between winter and spring. And so that cutoff between winter and spring is um, the 19th. So if it's, the, if it's the 1st to the 19th, it's winter. If it's the 20th through the 31st, it's spring. Whoops. Back. Actually, I have a little problem here. I just noticed. My bad. Apologize. All right. Okay, I'll fix that in a bit. That if down there, I just realized, is not indented properly. So I will indent that before I send it, uh, before I put it up on the site. And this follows that, okay? The same thing again and again and again. Remember, we're using ands here, and there are some times when you're just going to be evaluate. 
I'm sorry. I'm in a PowerPoint presentation and I'm not treating it like a power or a keynote presentation. So some of them you're going to just be evaluating the months and then to make sure the days are correct. Some of them you're going to have to do a deeper evaluation because they split a season. So March splits between winter and spring. June splits between spring and summer. So that is the pseudocode for 3.12. And I will do my best to end this soon unless anybody has any questions. Exact change. This is another complex problem. Now, one of the things you're going to need to do here is use the floor operator. But basically, you're putting in a value, an integer value, and you have to break that value down into numbers, sorry, to dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. Um, and so that is what you're doing. So if you have 45, you have one quarter and two dimes. So how do we do that in Python code? Well, let's go through the pseudocode. So there we go. Again, this is two columns, and it's a little bit, um, again, it's a longer program. Some of the reasons why we're doing this is to get you used to writing programs like this, because when you get to doing your game, you're going to have to understand the complexities of writing code like this. So I'm going to input some value, okay? And then I am going to check, first of all, is that value valid? Now this is something that's important to do, and it's going to be very important with your game, especially in my class because I like to put in invalid information when I'm testing your code. So the all I'm doing here is just saying, is it greater than zero? If so, sorry, if the input you gave me is less than zero, then we're just going to say, sorry, there's no change. Now I'm going to do a series of sets. And those series of sets use the floor operator. And you can find the stuff for the floor operator in section 1.16 of guidebooks for division and modulo. What the floor operator does is it basically says, give me the closest whole number without rounding up. And that's how you do this problem. You really, it's really hard to do otherwise. So basically, we're going to set the number of dollars is equal to the input value using the floor operator, 100. So if I had put in 105, I would get the number one back from the floor operator. And I'm going to say input equals input value minus the number of dollars times 100. So I am basically resetting the input value minusing the number of dollars that I have. So if I have $100, and I, sorry, if I put in 105, this statement, I would have five left. And then you go down just like that. So you do the same. The number of quarters, I'm, I'm going to change that just a bit. The number of quarters, the number of dimes, the number of nickels, and then whatever is left over are pennies. Then you go through the section where you're going to output it. Because what they've asked you to do is if it's $1, you put dollar. And if it's $2, you put the word dollars, plural. And you do that for all of the different denominations. So how do you do that? You use nested if statements. So if you, have, if you have some number of dollars, then you're going to output the number of dollars. If the number of dollars is equal to 1, oh, I did that in the wrong order. I'll fix that. Um, you're either going to output dollar or you're going to output dollars, and then you're going to output the number of dollars. I'll change that before I put it up. Um, if the number of quarters is greater than 10, you're going to do the same thing. Dimes, nickels, pennies, and then that's what you're going to do. So it's a lot of repetition in this pseudocode, but this is the logic flow. So does anybody have any questions on the labs or anything else?
Okay. I hope you guys have a good evening. I should have this up along with the pseudocode, uh, hopefully tomorrow. And I'm going to end, stop sharing and stop the recording now.